church and uh, New Year's Day service. Dr. Allen Hawk, thank you so much for being here and being with us in our worship today. It's always good to see you. Thank you. My pleasure. Now, we will have fellowship hour after, uh, after the service, but I'd like you to please note in your bulletin the message from Betty Mill, who is our uh, congregation facilitator. All here are needed for after fellowship social time. And the sign up sheet is in the narthex. So we ask you please sign up. I'd like to say congratulations to Lauren Sukin on her December graduation from James Madison University with a BS and RN in nursing. She was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Air Force, and her first duty station will be in Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> and there are many times cold. <laughs> Our Sunday prayers are extended to the family of Maggie Gilman, who died on December the 23rd. She was the sister of Mary Stewart and the wife of Fred Gilman. We ask for prayers for healing and for being lifted for Lynn Saunders, our pianist and coordinator of our music ministry. She is recovering from a bad fall that resulted in broken bones and crest. We're only a phone call away. If you need help, please call. Can you <laughs> I will for one more week. <laughs> we at least ask you to uh, please include Lee and Jim Purcell and all their loved ones in their in your prayers. Marlon Davis, Lee's dad, is in VCU. He's had quite a struggle, but had a better day yesterday and may move out of ICU today. Our yoga resumes January the 9th. St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church invites you to join our one-hour chair yoga class that meets on Mondays at 2 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Meals on Wheels, uh, January is our month, and uh, I can say we have a full slate now. Everybody's volunteered, so uh, just keep in mind, if you uh, haven't signed up, uh, maybe be on a... a Calling list. Please join me in our call to worship at a turn in your bulletin. In this Christmas season of great joy, we praise the Lord for in the mercy and abundant steadfast love, God has become our Savior. Even in times of danger and threat, we praise God who has set us free from fear and death.
that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. As we confess our sins, we come before one who was also tested, but and what he suffered, confident that he is able to help us. Please join me in the prayer of confession and prayer in your book. Merciful God, you be very loved you have claimed us as your children. We confess that we have not loved you as we should. We have not participated fully in your purposes and plans. We were weary and made up when we were to sorrow. We have not loved our brothers and sisters as we intended. And the blessings and the reverences of justice desire us. We fail to recognize our own complicity. Forgive us, especially when we fail to protect children so vulnerable and precious in your sight. Forgive our misuse of power against people and against your creation. Help us to praise you by living in harmony and peace. Do not be ashamed of us in sorrow, but to strengthen us in our time.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is indeed my great joy to be with you, especially on this first day of a new year. And I share the excitement of being able to share in fellowship and in friendship with you <coughs> this morning. First of all, I want to thank uh, Chris and the choir. Lynn would be very proud of you guys. You did great. Thank you so much. Uh, talked to Lynn the other the other evening just before she was, uh, I think, heading over to Sheltering Arts uh, for her rehab. So uh, hopefully she will get the uh, the kinds of strength again to be back with us shortly. So my thoughts and prayers with her. Uh, also want to uh, to say uh, kind of at the beginning. Uh, the, the wonderful uh, pleasure it is uh, to just share an experience of <coughs> Christmas and uh, to move past Christmas into the promise of a new year. And I hope that fills you with a sense of hope and energy as we begin 2023. <laughs> That seems difficult to say, and yet uh, that is where we are in this day. I'm excited as well to share with you some scripture that comes to us uh, as we think about this Christmas season. And these words are found in Matthew, the 13th chapter, uh, beginning at verse 13, as we have heard and listened to a portion of the story of the wise men that is recorded in Matthew. And then the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, uh, concerning the wise men in verses now, 13 through 23. Let's listen as we hear God's words speaking to us this morning. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. That was what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah. Weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. And so he got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. This is God's word. It's good news for us this day. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> this morning, as you're reading your bulletin, the title of the sermon, it says, New Year Deal. Now, that sounds a little bit like Las Vegas, I know. I'm not talking about a card game here. It actually was, and I, you know, probably my fault in my text to, uh, to Christy, uh, but it was actually going to be New Year, New Deal. And, and it comes from another really legitimate scholarly place, Harbor Freight, okay, uh, and in the newspaper. 
And Harbor Freight is kind of an important place for me because I like to go there. Uh, it's kind of like Lowe's and uh, uh, some of the other places like that, uh, even Ace Hardware here, uh, because it's got tools. And uh, you know, when I was thinking a little bit about the sermon, I was thinking about tools uh, for us to handle a new year. I was thinking about ways that we could deal with all of the things that are a part of what New Year is about. New Year's, do I dare say it, resolutions, right? And, and probably already you've been thinking a little bit about it, and I have been thinking a little bit about resolutions and, and, and things to, to make maybe my life more important and more meaningful um, and even more relevant. And uh, some of the things that I've been thinking about was, you know, I want to be more healthy. I want to eat kind of the right things, maybe lose a little weight, do the right kinds of things exercise-wise that, that will lead to, to a positive outcome in the days and years ahead, and hopefully even decades ahead. Uh, so I want to be a little bit more healthy. I want to be, as well, a little bit more patient. Uh, I spent uh, just before uh, Christmas Day I was with my uh, with my daughter and uh, grandson in, in Pennsylvania and uh, had just an awesome time uh, especially with the two and a half year old uh, who is both terrific and terrifying in some ways <laughs> uh, and uh, Caleb is uh, just just marvelous and love him to death um, but full of all of the things that terrific twos bring to uh, two-year-olds. So, uh, had, had a great experience. Though. One of the things while I was there uh, was, was noticing uh, something that, that I know happens, and that is with my daughter. And, and, you know, it seemed like every 10 seconds she would be getting a, a, a text or, or something, and she'd be... And uh, it, it causes me to, to remember that there are times sometimes with, with my daughter, who is a millennial, and who grew up in that time when they would rather text than talk, that I get a little frustrated because Dad wants to just talk on the phone, and she, of course, would rather just text. And so learning to be patient about what that means, and... Uh, who she is and who she grew up as. Uh, and that's also true with my mother as well. Kind of on the road back from, from uh, Pennsylvania, in a trip that uh, ordinarily takes four hours and 20 minutes, took seven and a half hours. Uh, and the patience wasn't so much reminding me because of the traffic, but but really in conversation some with my mom. And, and it kind of reminded me a little bit in some of our conversation and some of our stories uh, as we were talking that mom is of a generation uh, different from mine. She is in a generation that was called that great generation, that great generation that knew and understood what sacrifice was that understood what it meant to be frugal, that understood uh, what it meant to save. And, uh, you know, sometimes when, when I look around the house, and, you know, one of the things that I always notice is that every time you open the refrigerator door, stuff falls out of it. You know, it's just so jam-packed full of stuff. And, you know, first of all, Mom has saved every little plastic container, butter, anything that comes in a plastic container. She saved, and then she's put the leftover in there and put it and stuck it in the kitchen in the refrigerator. And every time you open that refrigerator door, one of those are falling off. And that's my mom. And, uh, and yet, that comes as well out of the generation. And so, instead of being upset by any of those things with my daughter or my mother, I like to be a little bit more patient. I'd also like to uh, to be better at planning. To to you know, they gave me at the hospital this great big desk calendar so I can write everything down. And you know, they do that for everybody, but I 
I, I find it very important and helpful to do that. And then my daughter gave me one of those daily, weekly planner things that you use, and I haven't obviously used them very much. <laughs> So I'd like, like to, uh, but resolutions, you know, they're tough, aren't they? Um, then, you know, I think one other thing, as I, as I think about resolutions that are important for me for this new year and, and this new beginning, and I don't know about you, but one other thing that, that as I look at those things about my health and kind of just personality, and, and the way I relate with others, especially those I care about so much and so deeply. Uh, the last thing is, I want to follow better. I want to be a better follower of, of, of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. I, I, I come to really functionally understand this, that, that follow Following is, is more than just believing. Following is also believing and obeying. And there are places and spaces in my life, as there are in each one of our lives, where some of what we know the Spirit of God is calling us to do and to be, we turn a deaf ear to. And I want to be more attuned to what God's Spirit is saying to me in this new year. Those are kind of resolutions. Those are the things that, that we say. And here's the problem with our resolutions. We somewhere very quickly kind of shrug them off. It's things that we have struggled with kind of all of our lives, isn't it? You know, when uh, at the very beginning, when uh, well, as we be, uh, started out, you know, kind of we had full head, full heads of hair, and you know, it was dark and brown, and everything looked good, and then it got a little gray, and then it got a whole lot grayer, and then it just completely turned all white. <laughs> Or, or maybe there's no hair at all. When we're, or even worse, maybe it's somebody else's hair. <laughs> but in all of that, there is this idea. And that is, these resolutions, these, these ways to approach a new year and, and to, to find a way to successfully navigate what this new year is about for us, I want us to take a, a look for a moment at these kind of words from Matthew. We know, of course, Matthew, the tax collector, he's, he's concerned about this tying about who Jesus is. And so we get this great sense of the genealogy, don't we? And, and we get this sense of, as well, that he is of the line and lineage of David, and we get all of that. And we get the place where, where Jesus uh, is moving to and from in this passage, from, from Bethlehem to Egypt, back to Nazareth. But in the process of all of this movement, he speaks to us about some wise men. And the wise men we know, of course, have come from a distance, from the east, to follow and to locate that place. And, and they have talked to scholars there in Jerusalem, just a few miles away from Bethlehem. And, and they have discovered where the Christ child would be, and they come. And, and when they come, they come and they, they bow down because they recognize that this, this incredible birth is the start of something new. They worship. And they, they give gifts. 
They give gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, recognizing the roles that Christ will play in the lives of the world in which he has come to save. They, they understand that, that there really is a new thing happening, a new deal, if you will. And this new deal is, is about Jesus who would come and we would call him Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. That there was this somehow cross upon the whole idea of what Christmas was about. There's a shadow of this cross upon Christmas because he came to give his life a ransom for many. And so the wise men understand this. And they come, they worship, they give their gifts. And then we know this, that in a dream they are told to leave and go a different way. And they do so. And also in a dream, Joseph is told these words. Joseph is told these words to flee from Bethlehem. Because Herod is about to try and kill all of the young infants and children there. And so Joseph takes Jesus and Mary and they go to Egypt. And there they are welcomed in Egypt with a large group of Jewish settlers who have been there as a result of the Maccabean revol revolts generations earlier. Even in the city of Alexandria, there's a large contingent of Jewish people settling there. And then there comes a time that Herod dies. And again, in another dream, Joseph is told to go back to Israel. And he does that, and he goes to this place, this kind of nowhere town that Nathaniel later on in the New Testament would ask, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's that kind of a little place, kind of like a northern neck community, maybe. <laughs> Nazarene. And there the baby becomes a child and grows. The story is also told of a fulfilling of prophecy. And the fulfilling of the prophecy was this. It was a quote that is found in the 11th chapter of Hosea, that out of Egypt the child would come. Out of Egypt. And so it is that that scripture is fulfilled. But if you don't know the story of Hosea, you miss the full impact of what this new deal is for us in this new year we can face our new lives that begin this day with a sense of direction and strength. The story is this. Hosea is a prophet. But Hosea is called upon by God to do something totally unusual. You remember that prophets oftentimes symbolize for the people, what God is doing. And in this time and place, God speaks to Hosea, and he says, Hosea, I want you to marry a woman of the streets, a prostitute. 
And it's going to communicate to those people that, that they have been unfaithful. That they have rejected me and, and gone to the other things of their lives. And so Hosea follows suit. And he meets this woman. This prostitute who is called Gomer. Now, you kind of know you're going to have trouble with a woman when her name is named Gomer, right? <laughs> I just, I don't know. And true to form, he does. And it gets so bad, and they have children. As a matter of fact, the ch one of the children's names is not my child. <laughs> and, and it speaks of the kind of rejection that the nation of Israel has shown toward God. And in that living out of that story, kind of illustrated through the life of Hosea and Gomer, what happens is that she deserts him and leaves him and goes off. And he's finally able after searching and searching to find her near the slave markets. And there he buys her back and takes her again as his own wife. Mm -hmm. And in that incredible story again, it shares and shows the rejection of Israel toward God. And yet how God is steadfast in his love and in his faithfulness to Israel. And so the story then of Hosea tells us, tells us something very important. It tells us that God loves us and that God truly is Emmanuel, God with us. I love Christmas. Always have. Even as a kid, one of the things I, I used to do is I used to uh, tell my parents what I wanted for Christmas, of course. And then I'd also tell them what I wanted in my stocking. And every year I would always say, uh, Mom and Dad, I want Santa to, to bring me a flashlight and put it in my stocking. Christmas. So every year I would get a flashlight, be in my stocking, and I would, I would wake up at three o'clock in the morning on Christmas morning. I would go to my stocking by the fireplace, take it down, reach in, get the flashlight, go over underneath the tree kind of open up the packages to see what I got, look in, see what it was, back and back, going back to bed, get up, and then be real excited again as I unwrap them and open them up. I always loved Christmas. And I still do. Even by myself, I have a tree and all of those things. I just love it, decorating outside. All of those things about Christmas I love. But the older I get, the more and more I understand what Christmas really is. You know, if you've been to enough Christmas parties and different things, they'll ask you, what was the best Christmas gift you ever got? And for me, it was always Secret Sam. Don't know, I grew up in the 60s, okay, when I was a small kid, and everything then was... James Bond had just done their first movie and everything was about spy stuff. And, and Secret Sam was this briefcase that had a camera in it and you could press the button and take a picture and nobody would know about it. It also had this gun inside and you could build it into a rifle. But you could also press the button on the side and it would shoot out these plastic bullets. I loved Secret Sam. <laughs> it was so cool. And I think back, and you know, as I was 
was uh, thinking about, and I have a, a number of, of Christmas presents that I grew up with uh, in, in, my, uh, in my den. One is, a, a, is one of those old metal Texaco fire trucks. Uh, and then there was another one that was the Texaco uh, uh, oil liner. And, uh, you know, it, it took me about a week to take the engine out of that thing and all of the different things to figure out how it worked. Loved Christmas, loved all of those things about Christmas. But here's the point in all of that. The point of, of Christmas is this. That no longer are we left <coughs> to deal on our own. No longer do we have to find ways to make our lives better by ourselves. Resolutions become a whole lot easier when we depend not on our resolutions, but on the revelation of who Jesus Christ is in our lives. And as we do that, we find a certain confidence in facing this year. This morning, as you think about where you are in your life, the greatest gift for you is it hope? Is it forgiveness? Is it a new start? Whatever it is, the God who comes to us at Christmas comes to us every day of every year. Let's bow together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being together as your people. It is our prayer, oh God, in these moments that you will alert us to the great glory of trusting in you, of knowing that no how bleak our lives are, you are present, that we can find our hope in you, that we can find forgiveness in you, that we can find new beginnings because you are faithful and steadfast in your love for us. These things, O oh God, we thank you and praise you. Amen. Let me invite you to stand this morning as we stand together for our affirmation of faith. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father of Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we uh, take a moment or two to share uh, good news and things that are happening in the life of our church and uh, as well concerns and uh, prayers for others. Do we have any joys this morning that we want to lift up? Anybody? Certainly we have something good to say, don't we? All right. I'll go. There you go. All right. Uh, I have a sister-in-law who lives in Buffalo. And throughout all of last week, she was snowed in, really snowed in. Talk about your bleak midwinter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she lived alone and, and really became quite worried about being snowed in. 
and she has made it through. The snow is beginning to melt. Most of her driveway has been plowed, and so things are better. So, Absolutely. Wow, that's terrific. You know, it was kind of funny. I, while they were singing, doing such a beautiful job on the bleak midwinter, I was kind of reading the words, and it was like snow upon snow. <laughs> Boy, that would be more effective if we had had that about three weeks ago or something, you know. But beautifully done. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Yes. Uh, our daughter, Jessie, and her family went skiing in Utah, and they got stuck in Donner Pass all the way home. So we're hoping that they get out in the next few days. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yes. That, that is one of the problems that you face when you go to... Uh, out west to go skiing. I had that happen once or twice. They, they live in California, so they had to cross down passages. Gotcha. Uh, okay, others this morning. How about concerns? People that we want to lift up in our thoughts and prayers. Anyone? Lynn. Definitely Lynn, absolutely. Others? Harley Davis. Harley Davis. Okay. Very good. Let's pause as we bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come this morning thankful for your presence here. Thankful that as we begin this new year, we begin it with one another. But we also begin it with you. We thank you, O oh God, that you are present here in our midst. That as we begin a new year of new possibilities and new hopes and new potential. That you come among us, not only to live among us, but to empower us and to encourage us. We thank you, O oh God, as well, that you lift up families who, who need your support and strength, encouragement, <coughs> healing. And we lift that to you, as we have mentioned, O oh God. And we come as well this morning, O oh God, in the different places and stages in life that we are, but knowing that your presence truly is light in the midst of darkness, that you provide for us, O oh God, the resources to be effective in our lives as followers of you. And so, O oh God, we ask you now to continue to lead and guide us throughout this new year. To be with us in such a way, O oh God, that we see the impact and the imprint of your love on how we act and how we live. Be with us now, O oh Father. Continue to watch over us as we grow together as a church family. And lead us to pray with sincerity of heart these words, O oh God. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. support for our church, for the way in which you uh, share your uh, gifts and your offerings uh, for the congregation that we might enrich and minister toward our community. So we thank you greatly for that, and we thank God for giving us the bounty which we may offer back to God uh, for use in his kingdom. 
And so we do appreciate your generosity and your giving. And we'll stand as we join together in our doxology. <laughs> Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. 